So in today's video, we're going to be covering toothpick flight controllers. Now, this is a very important topic because there has been a lot of advancements now and a lot of new boards are being able to handle quite a lot, which is a good thing. We've been waiting for this for quite a while. And right now I could think of three off the top of my head and one that you guys probably don't even know existed just yet, possibly. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover uh, a couple of them. We're going to take a look at them on the, on the site. I also have a couple here that I've tested, which we're going to drop down on the bench and take a look at. But we're going to also discuss why there were issues back then with these little baby crazy view boards that a lot of people were mostly facing. And how are they being remedied right now? It's actually a very simple fix, which we're going to cover in this video. So let's get started. So now if you don't know what a toothpick class is, it's basically a 2.5 inch quadcopter using very small motors being super light with pop on propellers that are really efficient, super quiet, and that you could just basically fly anywhere. That's the main benefit of these. Now when these first started coming out, uh, a lot of them were using these boards because you can use two types of boards. You can use a 16 by 16 or a crazy bee type board here. So it could be either this one, which we'll take a closer look at in the bench in a bit and one of these right here. This is a 16 by 16, and this is a crazy bee board. Now, both of these have their pros and cons, which we'll discuss right now. And uh, one of those is weight, and also some of them is power and repairability in a way. So let me explain this in a little bit deeper terms. Now, when these first started coming out again, we were using these crazy bee boards. Now, what's really nice about these boards is they're gonna make the overall weight super, super light. And why is that? Well, because it has a built-in receiver. It has the built-in ESCs, it has the built-in flight controller with the OSD, it has everything built into it. However, where these started to fail is something called the MOSFETs. Now these MOSFETs are in charge of the power delivery down to your motor. Each motor has a total of six MOSFETs, okay? So we're going to call them FETs now. Now, on these older Crazy Bee boards, you'll see them called Crazy Bee V1, V2, V2.1, and recently, we just got the V3. Now, the V3, I have tested, and I didn't even know I was testing, and we're going to cover that also in this video. So again, the pros of this is that everything is into one board. You're going to save a lot of weight, but the problem is if something goes bad, you're going to have to replace the whole thing. Another con of these is that the built-in receiver cannot get much range. And for example, here's the antenna. But that is an easy fix. You can go ahead and install your own external receiver, which we'll cover later on in a beginner's toothpick build guide video. So that is the pros and cons of this currently. Now, if we bring in a 16 by 16 stack, what's really nice about these and also could be hated, first of all, it's two boards. So weight is increased. Second of all, if something burns, you're easily going to be able to replace a half of it. But however, these two basically cost the same as this right now. But then again, the, the 16 by 16 boards don't have a built-in receiver. So you're still gonna need your external receiver there, but they have everything else you're gonna need basically. The main, main thing when you're buying these right now is to look at the FET size. Now the FET size doesn't really always tell you that it's gonna be a better MOSFET, but the size will help in heat dissipation, in power delivery, and that is what we're seeing now. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here's a great example. Now I've listed here the best ones that I am currently considering for a toothpick class. I'm sure there might be other ones, but these are the ones that I have used personally, some more than others, but these are the ones that I would feel safe recommending for one of you guys, especially on the higher demand now with the toothpicks that are being released currently. So here's a crazy bee board. Now this is the V2.1, keep that in mind. Anything 2.1 and below, they're using these really, really small micro MOSFETs in order to do the power delivery down to the motor. It's these little guys. Now it's very difficult to kind of see that here on this picture, but I'm gonna compare it to you under the bench in a bit here. Now, recently, Eoshin released their Twig, which everyone, I didn't know it was a clone, which is a clone of the original Twig. However, they've released the Crazy Bee Pro V3. Now, I didn't know this until I started, you know, doing my research for this video because I was coming here to recommend two of these. Uh, this wasn't one of them. But, you know, I was noticing, like, how is this Crazy Bee board handling the, uh, the Twig here? Because the Twig is using much, much larger motor, not much larger, two, two millimeters plus motors and it's using bigger propellers, which will need a lot of current and a lot of power to go through. However, 
you can tell that they're almost double the size and these are bigger MOSFETs and this is something you want because these fat sizes is what's found on our 20 by 20 flight controller uh, ESCs and also even some of our big ESCs. So this is a huge step in the right direction. However, it still carries most of its cons, which is uh, you don't get very far distance with the built-in receiver, but then again, that could be remedied with an external receiver. And also, if something goes bad on this board, you're gonna have to replace the whole thing. But again, it's not that expensive. You can order them without a receiver, FlySky receiver, or an FR Sky receiver. So these boards right now are pretty good. I haven't put much time into the V3.0, but then again, I haven't had the V 2.1 burn on me because I didn't put these V2.1s in a very high demanding power quadcopter and I've also always added the low ESR capacitor because that is a must it will help soak up those extra currents or those extra voltages all these bad little voltage spikes and stuff and help you extend the life of these crazy B boards and that goes for any other flight controller it is highly recommended you do that. However, now we're going to go to the two 16 by 16 flight controllers or stacks for toothpicks that I have tested personally and I am still using constantly. So currently we have the HJLRC FD413. Now this comes in two flavors. I'll have them linked down below. There's one that comes with a VTX and one that comes without the VTX. The VTX is pretty good. I've actually used it and I've actually used this stack for quite a while, but not more than the iFly stack, but they're still performing on par with each other. Really great. No issues, bunch of crashes, nothing burnt so far. Huge plus, especially with the iFly. It burned the motor and it didn't burn itself out, which is a good sign because it's giving all the power the motor needs. Um, and uh, if the ESC were to burn, then the motors are too powerful for that ESC. But if the ESC burns the motor, then the ESC is good. I mean, that's kind. Of, it's not like the definitive answer, but it is a, a good sign. So the, I know the iFly is good. I know the HGLRC is good. The Crazy B is still too early, but it seems to be handling its big motors just fine. So this is one of them. It's really great. I'm going to show you how to connect this one up because I have a brand new one here. So we'll do a connection guide as well in this video later on towards the end of it. $40 is a great price, obviously, because um, the, this is the kind of the, the range that they're coming in. I really like how they kept it $40 compared to the Crazy B, even though it's coming with two boards and it's coming with a lot of other extra things here. Like a bunch of, you know, they even give you the low ESR capacitor, the connector, the XT30. And again, we'll take a look at that once we get it on the table there. So here's the second flavor here. And again, these are all linked down below. This one comes with the VTX and I could recommend this VTX that it's a really great VTX because I have tested it personally in the Bando and no issues. And yeah, so it's good. Now the iFlight V1 success, this is also a 12 amp ESC one. It is also using the big FETs, which is a huge, great sign. And it is slightly cheaper, but I have put a lot of time into this, so I can safely say I'd, I'd recommend for the toothpick class. Now, I recommend doesn't mean doesn't make it the best. There could be stuff that are way better, but this is in terms of my experience in my flying. So keep that in mind. So I make these videos in order to help you make a purchase from my current experience here in order for you not to uh, lose money. So basically help you avoid a purchase or make a purchase. Now, what's really nice with the iFlight here, for me personally, not a lot of people like this, is that it uses the pins. So you're not gonna need a connector to connect the ESC down to the flight controller. So that's something what I like about the iFlight, but a lot of people don't like the pins. Uh, for example, I think on their latest one, they removed the pins. This is the V2 here. Um, this is also really great. It's a revision of the V1, but it has slight modifications done to it, but basically identical here. The VTX I could vouch for also on these. They're really great. And I'm using it again, uh, right here. However, on mine right here, I'm using the uh, V1. I've used the V2 too, not as much as the V1, but yeah, they're both really great. This is slightly more expensive, 50 bucks, but if you don't know how to solder, it comes with the ESC with connectors, so you can connect that in. So that, could, that is one of the biggest revisions they've done here for it. And um, overall, there's are still really, really great prices for the amount of performance you're getting. Here's a V1 with a VTX, also 46 bucks. I'll have them linked down below and some coupons for you guys. So these three are basically, in my opinion right now, the top three, but the Geb RC could also be in there. I haven't tested it personally, but I am going by what I have used and put time into. And again, some more than others. I could 100% vouch for the HGLRC and the iFlight. The ESG and Crazy B is still too early, but I could vouch actually for the 2.1 if you put a low ESR capacitor because I've, I've used that more than anything and I have yet to have one burn. Even the 2.0 never burned on me, but this is my experience and everybody's experience was going to be slightly different. Uh, with these, usually with the 2.1s and below, I would turn off air mode 
um, because that can burn the ESC sometimes or the motor actually. So keep that in mind and just be careful with that. But these latest ones here are showing really great progress and I really like the price. The price is really great as well. Obviously we could, we always want lower prices, but I think it's an acceptable price in my opinion for the things you're getting here. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the HDLRC right now and put it under the bench and uh, see how to connect it and um, just overall help you make an educated guess more than anything. So let's go check it out. All right, so here I've gotten a couple boards for us to take a look at. Here's the HDLRC that I was talking about earlier. Here's the Crazy B 2.0. Here's the Nameless Crazy B board. It's called the Nameless. And here's a 20 by 20 stack that's meant for really big quadcopters. And I want to put this into consideration or for you to kind of get a perspective on the size of the FETs that I was talking about. It's also going to be a little bit difficult on my camera here. So let's start out with the HDLRC ESC here. Now if you compare it to the 20 by 20 stacks, we see we're almost on the same size here. It's pretty insane. And if I were to grab one of these older Crazy B boards, look how tiny those FETs are compared to the current uh, boards that are being released. And this is why these would be really great in, in overall high demand quadcopters and also crashes because crashes is where you have the highest voltage spikes and also in rush of current going everywhere. So a big FET can dissipate that and could handle that just fine. So if an ESC and again burns the motor, it's more likely a good ESC than a bad ESC. But if the ESC burns and the motor is okay, then the ESC wasn't able to handle that crash or that motor. So here's also the Crazy B 2.0. And I'm not saying these are bad boards. I'm just saying you're not going to be able or it's not really recommended to put something that's going to be very power hungry, such as this right here, which is the Eosheen Twig here, using 1105 motors right here with these really big propellers. That's gonna need a lot of current going through it. So those wouldn't be really recommended here. And good thing Eosheen did come up with the 3.0 with the bigger FETs, the same size as the HGLRC here and also the iFlight. Now the HGLRC version again is really, really great. I've used it personally. And also the iFlight is on my favorite toothpick right now. And uh, we'll take a closer look at that in a bit. So you see the size difference here, and that really does play a really big role in the overall life expectancy of these boards here. So to extend the life of these boards right here, especially the older version, even the newer ones, even the ones with the big FETs, you always want to add a low ESR capacitor. Now two good name brands would be Panasonic and also Rubicon, which is R-U-B-Y and then C-O-N, Rubicon. This one is a no-name brand, or it is a brand, it's called Vent. I've never heard of it personally, but the Rubicon and Panasonics, I have personally tested on my testing setup for noise, and I do have those videos from like a year ago, so I know those are really, really great, and that's why I'd recommend those, but these will also still do the job just fine. However, some will do it better job than others, but not by much, especially on something this, this tiny here. All right, so right now we've put the other boards to the side. So we take a closer look at the HDLRC to help you understand how to connect it. If you are currently looking for a toothpick sized stack and or a replacement for a current toothpick. So in order to install the HDLRC stack in your quadcopter, when you install the ESC, this connector should be facing the front of the quadcopter because of the motor orientation, which is very important here. And these two back here would be where this XT60 connects to, and this actually comes in the package. However, something I'd highly recommend is to shorten these wires to possibly around this much because long wires do, do introduce noise into the system, and that can bleed into your gyro and give it these really bad weird oscillations that will never be tuned out. So it is always recommended to have your battery cables as short as possible. Now also what's really nice with the HDLRC is they also provide you with the capacitor which I would also try to shorten out here. So the way that I would personally install it is I would put this on one side of the battery connectors and this would be on the other. So let me give you an example here. Now if we flip this over we see this says BAT. So BAT is going to be the red which is going to be the positive. G and D is the ground which is going to be the black one. So I would go ahead, This we said this was bat right here. I'd probably install this on the top just like this. I'd solder that there and this one there. And then I would get this one and solder it on the bottom. It'll make it much, much easier than to put these two together. But if you're able to put them together, that's even better for you. And as you can tell, we have really nice big fat capacitors, which I haven't seen on these tiny boards uh, yet. And I really do like that here. They are trying to put a lot of filtration into this and it does increase its overall life expectancy and helps with the noise filtration such as helping with bad voltage spikes and these types of things and also voltage drops. So it is a really nice, well executed piece of hardware here. All right, so now we have the flight controller and the way to connect your flight controller, once your ESC is connected, let's go ahead and pretend that the 
ESC was connected and it did have its power rails. And here's the flight controller. Now, now common sense might tell you to put it like this, but that would be wrong. And also might tell you to put it like this, and that would also be wrong here. The correct way to install this would be like this. The connector up top, and here we have a connector up top. And these connectors play a very big role. One, it provides the power to the flight controller from the ESC here because the power comes in from the battery to the ESC. Then with the connector, it provides power for the flight controller. Second, it allows you to control each motor's output. So flight control will tell motor one to be on full blast and that's how it would do it. So this connector plays a very, very big role. Now, in terms of the iFlight one, it's just basically pins that would be down here somewhere and you could just pop it in and that does all the connection for you and it does reduce weight, but some people like connectors and some other people like pins and some people don't care like myself here. And here we see we have all of the pads broken out. What's really nice also is they do give you a pretty detailed instruction manual here if you ever get lost. All right, so now let's take a look at the board and see how we would connect our camera, VTX, and as well as our receiver. So for the camera, it's gonna be pretty simple here. This line would be the video, which we, would be the yellow line coming in from your camera. The next one down is going to be the five volt. So this will give five volt to your camera. And then on the bottom here, the third one down is going to be the black wire, which is the ground. So for the video transmitter's connection, again, it has to be five volts. So the bottom pad here would be the video line, which is the yellow line. Next up would have the five volt line, which is the red line or the red wire. Next is going to be the ground. And then the last one up here is going to be one of the TXs for smart audio. So this is if you wanted to control your video transmitter through the on-screen display. Now, when connecting the receiver to this, you need to take something into consideration because if you have S bus, then it's going to have to go to a specific pad. And if you have I bus, then it'll have to go to another pad because this is an F4 flight controller and it does matter where you connect the signal of your receiver here. So if you're using I bus, what you'd want to do is you would want to put your iBus signal right here, whether it be iBus or Spectrum, it would be right there. And if you are using SBus, which is an FR Sky, then you would want to put your signal right here. So now we know where is iBus and SBus. So for example, let's bring in a full blown connection for an SBus receiver, which is FR Sky. I would put my signal right here. I would put my five volt right here and I would put my ground right here. Now, if I had an iBus, then I would put my signal right here on this one, and then I'd still give it five volt from here and ground from here, and I should be set to go into that perspective. So also we have two more pads right here. Now, what you can do, for example, this is really nice actually and very thoughtful. If your video transmitter is not a five volt transmitter, then you'd be able to get the battery voltage from this pad. So you'd put the red wire here and connect the ground like you would normally do. And if you wanted 5 volt, then just take it from here because one of these is 5 volt and the other one is battery. And I'm just going to double check here because it's super, super tiny. So for the battery voltage, it's actually the top one. And for the 5 volt, it's on the bottom one. So if you needed the video transmitter to take battery voltage, then you would put the red wire here and connect the rest down here. So keep that in mind also. So it's very well thought through. And overall, I've been using it again, and it's a really great piece of hardware that I'd highly recommend right now. And well, that's going to include it for this video, guys. If you have any questions or any suggestions, feel free to let me know. And I'll have everything linked down below. If you could check those out, those greatly support the channel. And also come join my Patreon. I have a ton of giveaways from companies, Skyzone OLEDs, FR Sky Transmitters, constantly new giveaways for everybody. Even the newer Patreons of each month have a separate giveaway for them. So your probabilities of winning are very high. And it also supports the channel. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out, guys.